Is it laugh at Kotaku time again? <laughs> yes, yes, I do believe it is. As Kotaku have gotten their panties in a bit of a twist, as Nintendo has refused to give them early release codes for the latest Zelda game for reasons nobody could possibly understand. <laughs> It's not like Kotaku actively encouraged people to pirate their games and, well, not only encouraged it, but told them how to do it. <laughs> I think I can't imagine that creating any sort of enemies or a Nintendo or anything. <laughs> pure, pure pettiness, no doubt. <laughs> As uh, one of Kotaku's games, Yorinalists, is saying here on Twitter, it's preview day for Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, a huge game I would love for Kotaku to be able to inform its millions of readers about firsthand. <laughs> let me just... Let me stop you there, buddy. You're, you mean Kotaku. <laughs> uh, mm. You don't have millions of readers. You have, okay, okay, okay. That's a pinch unfair, because Kotaku probably has millions of hits, because it is a mainstream gaming news site that is being heavily pushed by the algorithms. That's why. It's not a site that actually has readers or followers. It is a site that has ridiculous clickbaity headlines like how to take Ashley's tank top off, or five things you need to know about this video game, which you already knew at the moment you click on it, or basic guides to how to do shit. In fact, I remember um, another article by another one of the intrepid games journalists basically explaining that the main reason why they earn any money was due to guides and stuff like that. It was during the Hogwarts Legacy nonsense, where, uh, was it... Was it, was it the game or something like that? That is a, that's a misnomer, if anything. Complained about not being able to write clickbaity guides for Hogwarts Legacy because that was their primary source of income. Kotaku does not have readers. It has search hits. It has, I'm stuck on this puzzle, please help me. That kind of stuff, but we're wandering off point. Unfortunately, Nintendo still has it blacklisted from advanced coverage, a move I would argue is both unprofessional and coercive. Oh, those are words I do not want to hear from Kotaku anytime soon. <laughs> Unprofessional, Kotaku, you, you, you don't say. Oh, coercive. Hey, you are a culture warrior website, but okay. An interesting thing here is that, in theory, I sort of do kind of agree. Not with the blacklisted Kotaku with the part. That one is obviously an inherent moral good. In fact, I would go so far as to say that it should be the baseline of all morality. I'm pretty sure that if we look back far enough, we will find a Greek philosopher that mentions that you should be blacklisting Kotaku. He doesn't even know what that means. He simply had to say it because it is literally the bedrock of any normal, sane, healthy human being. But the embargo thing, and the, um, the withholding of review code. So, I've got enough moss on me to remember the age of the titans, like Total Biscuit, who had real genuine integrity there, at least for a while until he went a little bit crazy near the last few years, but he was one of the best game reviewers ever, unmatched to this day, in my opinion. And they were talking about this idea, because one of the first Western companies to do this was Bethesda, if memory serves, uh, that started withholding review codes for certain sites. Now, the sites in question were universally the ones that put politics above gaming, so nobody cared. In fact, they cheered. But a fair few personalities at the time pointed out that, hold on, doesn't this eventually just mean that these big gaming companies will simply hand out review codes to people they know will treat them well? And... Yes, yes they will. In fact, that is the entire idea behind access journalism, which is what the mainstream gaming media is all about today. Kissing the boot ever more vehemently in the hopes that they will not be overlooked the next time a hot game release comes along. And this is obviously not a very good state of affairs for us, the consumers. Now, if Kotaku, if this guy more correctly, had even two little brain cells to rub together, he would not say unprofessional and coercive, he would say unprofessional and anti-consumer, because it's not really coercive towards you, Kotaku. You antagonized Nintendo. You've been licking the boot all you can, but you then decided to actively piss them off, which is just idiotic. 
because it is anti-consumer. You will have fewer acts, fewer reviews, you'll have fewer people looking through it. Now, one of the problems is too, of course, these people don't really review video games. In fact, he goes on to cover another person saying, I wrote more about the experience of playing and reviewing Star Wars Jedi Survivor more than my nuanced take on the game itself. So this is a guy who wrote a review about Jedi Survivor and spent most of the time, presumably, whinging about having to review it. This is a common thing. The, um, the so-called Hogwarts Legacy review, for example, that started with two paragraphs of some random chick talking about her sex toys collection. Game reviews are not sustainable and hurt freelancers the most who have to crunch to hit absurd embargoes while getting paid peanuts relative to the time required, at least for most AAA games. Again, there is a kernel of truth here, but it ignores the fact that gaming journalism is actually literally dead. Gaming reviews on YouTube are still a thing. It is still a fairly big thing, although that too is under threat, particularly when it comes to early access to anything. YouTubers don't get early access to shit unless they're absolutely massive. Um, Jim Sterling, before he went loco, was actually pretty damn good when he came to criticizing the gaming industry. He pointed out, for example, that some of his insiders and gaming companies explained that they had a rating system for reviewers. There were sure shots, they would always get the best review codes, they'd be invited to events, etc., because they could be trusted. They have a proven track record of being viable, and the company knew what to expect from them. Then you had the wild cards. These were the people that could go either way, because most of the time they would actually just, you know, deliver a good review, reviewing the actual product. If they went the right way, then that would be a big boost because you would get that seal of authenticity. If they did not, however, they could literally sink a product. Jim Sterling used to be one of those people. No more, of course. And TV? Well, he was probably the biggest one of them all. Uh, near the end of his life... Ah, oh God, I... I am genuinely goddamn saddened by his passing, because despite the crazy, again, he was the best game reviewer, but wandering off topic again. I remember um, his, uh, his, his editor guy made a video after his death explaining that he wasn't getting review codes anymore, and TV was kind of upset about this because he was a huge deal and he was very famous for his reviews, but, well, the company simply didn't send him stuff because they couldn't check, uh, they, they couldn't know what he was going to say. And so they realized that it was better to send out a thousand reviews codes to tiny channels with a couple thousand subscribers that they knew could be bought, rather than sending out one review code to a, you know, a million subs channel, which they never knew which way it could go, because they could potentially sync them again. This also resulted in the idea of embargoes. That was a little, that was a little bit before that again, where they were like, okay, well... Um, the various outlets and competitors get an unfair advantage if one side gets it there and then one other side gets it another time. Okay, so if we give everybody the same embargo, we guarantee the most level playing field. But since a game of course can't just sit around for months after being finished, these embargoes tend to be very very short, meaning that people will have to play the game very very quickly to get through it the crunch time. And yeah, no, that is a legitimate concern as well, but again, if you were an actual gaming journalist, you might be able to extrapolate from the hours that you have access to the game whether or not there are any serious flaws or concerns with it at the very least. As people these days are more interested in, well, first taste reviews rather than the old school played through the whole thing detailed analytic thing. In fact, most people just watch that now for the spoilers these days. <clears throat> he also mentions, the failed economic of reviews at embargo is also why game sites, including some of the biggest, seem to be relying on freelancers more and more, despite having previously said that freelancers don't actually earn anything. He's explained the problem without apparently realizing it. Game reviews don't earn money. Because frankly, there are much better reviewers out there than you and Kotaku. As again, the primary way they get clicks is via guides, via clickbait articles, via dumbass nonsense, via explaining how to get the green plant at the end of the newest Mario game, etc. Not game reviews. The sites themselves are not earning a lot of money either, so they can't afford to have dedicated staff to do this. They certainly can't have a staff member dedicating a full week to playing a game that they don't even know if will be really popular. And even worse still, if it's a bad review, they could lose access to the gaming company, so they can't risk that either. Like, it's not a question of journalism at all anymore, it is literally paid reviews that the sites want.
In turn, the companies too begin boycotting those companies that don't tread the line. Now again, in the case of Kotaku, this is a hole of their own making. They've been digging this one with fervor for years, or putting politics before the actual video games. Why on God's good earth would Nintendo, one of the relatively few companies that still put the game before the politics, has proven relatively succinctly with the current Mario movie, which was allegedly going to be a hell of a lot more, more woke, but Nintendo put their foot down, why would they risk their reputation on people that they know they probably politically disagree with, and people who do again put that politic before their actual professionalism? Ah, it is mildly infuriating, because again, you, there is absolutely a problem here. In, in a perfect world, Every person above a certain benchmark, because you know, you gotta wean out the weenies, maybe everybody above like um, 50,000 subscribers, you know, because it takes a while to get that. It's not an achievable goal for the majority of people on YouTube subscribers, or an equal following in other platforms. Everybody who asks and can provide these credentials were entitled to a review code. <clears throat> now, I would also argue that in reality, you don't even need a review code, but getting early access to it is, of course, preferable because everybody gets it on the same day, release day, then everybody has to compete to be the ones to get it out first, which lead to yet further unhealthy practices of people rushing through it, not deliberating properly, etc, etc, etc. But everyone who reach that quantity should then be given a review code and everybody should then be entitled to put up whatever they wanted of that game. That would be the ideal. It's not the world we live in, it is not the world we are probably likely to ever living again, as there was a time when that was pretty much the truth. Hell, there was a time when companies would give out keys to just anybody who wanted it because they were desperate for the attention as it was genuinely difficult to get news about a new game out there. Several big titles flopped completely because, well, people didn't know they existed. Whereas now, getting your game title out there is the easiest part of them all. But making sure that you don't get slammed before the game is even on store shelves well, that's difficult, and in large part is why certain game companies will hire people specifically to proofread scripts and books and TV shows and everything sensitive readers to try and avoid any mm, controversy that could sink sales numbers, or as Hogwarts Legacy proved, boost them. <laughs> I look forward to the day of reverse sensitive readers. <laughs> Unironically, it would probably be a rather brilliant move. It's like, okay, since Steve Reader, what triggers you about this book? Well, there's racism on page 220, okay? Note 220, increase by at least twice and send out a press warning to all of the usual media sites that we're doing it. <laughs> mm. Oh, God. See, part of me. Part of me just wants the schadenfreude of looking at Kotaku and going, yeah, no, you did this to yourself. You screwed yourself, you are a dying website, you have been for ages, and now that all of the investor money is also starting to dry up, it's only a question of time before you go the way of BuzzFeed News, as people have long since recognized your incredible dishonesty. But another part of me too, can't help but be a little bit saddened by everything we've lost, in large part due to gaming journalism, mind you as well, when it came to the ability to actually get honest critique of games out there to anyone and everyone who wanted it. I've been hearing rumours, for example, that Jedi Survivor, the game I will be streaming tomorrow, apparently has an ass load of performance problems, which I won't know, because of course, uh... <laughs> I'm definitely not on Star Wars goodie boy list, and I couldn't tell you before I actually experienced it myself. So, it's one of those things. Who do you trust? Some, and it was by too, some random website goes like, oh, it has performance problems. I was also told by very self same websites that Atomic Heart was apparently a terrible video game that it wasn't going to run at all because of all kinds of developer backlash and drama behind the scenes, which turns out to have primarily been political in nature. And Atomic Heart, well, it ran just fine for me. And for a studio's very first game, it was certainly quite something. It wasn't the groundbreaking miracle perhaps people had anticipated, but it certainly wasn't a bad game, despite many people trying to convince me it was before the game had even seen the light of day. Ah, what has the world even come to when I have to at least pseudo defend Kotaku? <laughs> I'm gonna have to go and take a long, long 
cold shower now to calm down a little bit, I think. Mm. Until next time, I've been Arch. Have a good day.